Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thanks for logging on. Today we have a clash of titans. What do they have in common? Well, they're stainless steel, they're 40 millimeters, they're Rolex, and they are the two hottest models in the current Rolex catalog. It's GMT Master 2 versus Rolex Cosmograph Daytona. We're going to go with our elder statesman first. Whereas the first GMT Masters bowed in late 1954, the first Daytonas didn't arrive until 1963. This one is the elder statesman because the basic model, the caliber, the case, the architecture that you see here, bowed back in Y2K. You better believe this one's Millennium Bug compliant. It's lasted ever since with few refinements. We've seen a new ceramic bezel, we've seen a new hairspring, we've seen a new clasp design, but for the most part, this is the six digit Daytona that bowed back in the year 2000 with very few refinements it's managed to remain one of the hottest models in the Rolex catalog I'm going to back out a little bit so you can see the watch on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist the last major update to this watch was 2016 when it gained the black serochrome ceramic bezel and you can see still 40 millimeters in diameter on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist it's an easy watch to wear it's slim it's handsome it's nicely tapered at its tips it's only 12.2 millimeters thick so both of these watches will fit underneath the cuff. The timepiece has a 20 millimeter spacing between the lugs and if you measure it lug to lug you're going to find it's a very reasonable 46.6 millimeters even with the solid end links. You can see this one only spans 50.5 millimeters. I'd recommend both of these watches on their bracelets for wrists as small as 14 centimeters circumference. Easy watch to wear. You have a Rolex Oyster bracelet here distinct from the five link Jubilee dress style that you see on the GMT. Now getting a little bit closer you'll appreciate some of the refinements of the Oyster. It is simply a a more massive bracelet. There's more material here. It's more structurally imposing. It has greater structural integrity on the wrist. It appears larger, more massive, and in fact, it is. It's a sporty bracelet with a sporty clasp. Here you can see Rolex gives you two closure systems. There is a beak and a hook system internally. You can see the beak coming into contact with the hook and it snaps shut. There's a second lock, a clamshell style over the top, so you have double shore tight security. The GMT only has the single beacon hook system. There's an easy link 5mm adjustment system and you can see internally there are a few stationing posts so you can use that strap tool to change the anchoring point of the bracelet inside the clasp. Externally, combination of satin finish and a straight through polished center. A pre-super case design here and I really should clarify what I mean by super case. You can see when I put them crystal to crystal how sheer and squared off the case is on the GMT compared to the graceful, almost organic taper, and the curved sides, and the slender tips of the lugs, and it's just the difference between something that seems very much of a machine ethic and industrial against something that seems a little bit vintage and pre-industrial. So let's talk a bit about this dial and case, getting everything back in focus now. The watch does feature an imposing combination of stainless steel and, of course, a serochrome bezel. All of the characters inside the bezel, these little hash marks, triangle indexes, and as you can see, the numerals, they're actually platinum deposit inside the bezel. The bezel is gloss black and very scratch resistant. You can see on the crown side, trip lock crown. The watch is 100 meters water resistant, but it has the 300 meter trip lock. I'll bet it's underrated. You can see it features shear guards and screw down crowns for the chronograph actuators. I'll also mention that the timepiece features a dial that is beautifully balanced and symmetrical. No 24 hour hand, no date, just three registers, hours, minutes, and seconds, white gold indices, white gold Rolex coronet, a gloss lacquered base with the classical red Daytona script at six o'clock, and you can see silvered metallic tracks for the sub-registers of the dial. The watch is loomed, just not as effectively as the GMT. Underneath the case back, 72-hour power reserve, caliber 4130, 44 joules, automatic winding, 4 hertz beat rate, free sprung with a full balance bridge for shock resistance, parachrom blue hairspring for anti-magnetism, brigade overcoil architecture to help it keep excellent time in any position on the wrist or your dresser at night, COSC certified Swiss chronometer cased up and retested by Rolex to no worse than plus 2, minus 2 seconds per day. That is the superlative chronometer designation. And significantly, it is a vertical clutch column wheel chrono. So you have that crisp column wheel function selector, and then you have the vertical clutch that allows the seconds hand to start without any jump or stagger. There's no play in the system, and if you like to have center seconds with your minutes and hours, just leave it running. Thanks to the vertical clutch, there is no additional wear, tear, or hazard to your movement. Now, jumping over to the GMT, I think it's important we compare these two bracelets side by side, because I talked about the Oyster being more imposing and massive, and you can really see to good effect how dramatic the difference is. These are very distinct watches. But the thing is, 
because people want to own the sports Rolex of the moment. People wind up cross-shopping these watches. I was struck years ago when Edmunds.com published data suggesting people were cross-shopping Jeep Wranglers, Ford F-150 pickups, Honda Accords, and BMW M3s. Well, if you can cross-shop those, you can definitely cross-shop in-house among Rolex sports watches. The bracelet is a handsome piece. As you can see, it wears with an elegance and refinement on the wrist that's largely absent with the Oyster. The Oyster is handsome. This this is graceful. There is a difference. You can see the timepiece on my wrist wears well. It appears to be thicker because of the squared off profile of the super case, but in fact, it's not. It's 12 millimeters thick versus 12.2 for the Daytona. We'll zoom out a little bit and maybe we darken the aperture a bit to reduce some contrast. And you can see that the watch does sit gracefully. Because of the rotating bezel, it looks a bit chunkier, but remember, it's not. It's actually thinner. Now, lug to lug, it is a larger watch. Not 46.6, but 48. But when you include the solid end links of the Super Jubilee bracelet, you're going to find that this watch is 49.5 millimeters lug to lug, so it is narrower across the wrist by one millimeter than the Daytona. 20 millimeter spacing between the lugs, but these days when you buy a Rolex on a bracelet, you're gonna wear the Rolex on the factory bracelet. Now, I, I mentioned that term Super Jubilee. It originated back in 2005 when we gained the all solid link Jubilee bracelet on that generation of Datejust that bowed in 05. You can see all of the links are solid, as with the Oyster, all of the removable links are fixed in place by screws. It's a graceful bracelet with polished center links, staggered link size and alignment. And although it is the more dress-oriented bracelet, because it has more gaps between the links, it winds up being more comfortable and venting the wrist better. The Super Jubilee may look dressy, but it can absolutely be a sports watch bracelet. Pardon me, both these clasps featuring a lift lock. I apologize. You can see that this one featuring a almost identical setup and that goes right down to the easy link system and internally you can see that there are three stationing positions that allow you to place the root of the bracelet anywhere you like. So you have some fine tuning adjustments that don't involve removing an individual link. Now getting close to the case, it's not as well integrated in my opinion to the case band as the Oyster is. As you can see the Oyster is almost completely seamless whereas the Jubilee creates a little bit more visual dissonance where it joins the case flank and part of that is down to the squared off and sheer sides of the case. There's not a whole lot of grace here as you can see they're a little bit chunky in a way that the Daytona's lug tips are not. You also appreciate the fact here that because of the disparity between link size and the width of the actual lugs, it's close enough. There's some asymmetry, but it's close enough that the integration doesn't appear quite as smooth. That's just opinion, but I feel strongly about it. Now, jump into the business end of this watch, you can see there is a Cerachrome bezel. It features both blue and red. This debuted in 2014 on the white gold Pepsi. Same fabrication here. It's a bi-directional rotating unit. It has the same platinum deposits as the Daytona inside the wells showing its indices and numerals. And it is a bi-directional rotating GMT bezel. So if you set that 24-hour hand to Greenwich Mean Time, you can then use your local port or airport of destination GMT offset to temporarily find a third time zone Alternately, if you just want to use it as a timing organ, you can do that and just pretend that this is 60, 15, 30, 45. It's not a dive bezel, but you can still use it as a timing instrument if you're not using it to calculate. Now, the dial is a black lacquer with larger white gold indices than you'll find on the Daytona. This one aces the loom shot. There's less symmetry about the dial, but it's perhaps more useful as the combination of a date and a second time zone likely will find daily employment, whereas a chronograph is an occasional professional mandate. It's something that's more of an indulgence than a necessity for most folks. The timepiece does feature a next generation 3285 movement inside, 70 hour power reserve, and yes you heard correct, 72 for the Daytona, 70 for the 3285 per Rolex, 4 hertz beat rate, free sprung, full balance bridge, overcoil hairspring, power chrome blue, all the good stuff, 31 joules. It has that same superlative chronometer designation, so plus 2, minus 2 per day. It uses Rolex's next generation escapement, however, that is not found in the Daytona. It's known as Chronergy, using Liga etched components. It works in tandem with a larger mainspring inside a thinner barrel to extend the power reserve from the previous 48 all the way out to 70. The watch, again, just like the Daytona, a trip lock crown that you typically see on the 300 meter models, but the watch is nominally rated to 100 meters. Like the Daytona, it has stop seconds. Unlike the Daytona, and I'll show you this to good effect, you have the ability to 
independently set a second time zone and even drive the date forward or backwards as you cross the international date line. One more reason why I think this is probably the more practical of the two watches. So let's call out their advantages. Okay, Daytona, jumping straight in, let's talk a little bit about the Cosmograph. This is a timepiece that features a chronograph, so first and foremost, if that is a requirement for you, if you're a professional type who bills hours, a race fan, or perhaps one who's inclined to coach the kids' track team at the high school, well, this is the perfect option for you. It works beautifully, and quite simply, the opponent has no such chronograph. A cleaner dial, you can see both in terms of the economy of hands, there are only three at center, and the balance of the architecture, whereby you have a register at nine, a register at three, a register at six, and a crown up at 12. There is no date aperture, there is no cyclops eye. Very clean. I'll also mention that the bracelet is objectively more robust, and for now, unless you want to go white gold, you're getting your Pepsi on a Jubilee. You're Batman too, as of today. I'll mention that the timepiece has a wonderful double dial option that is not available on the Pepsi GMT, whereas the original Pepsi GMTs, the 6542s, did come with white and black dials back in the 50s. Rare white dials, but they were out there. This watch comes with your choice of white or the black that you see here. This is my preference, but you can choose either. The Pepsi Steel GMT, one choice. I'll also mention that this has a more graceful case, and it's really not even close. Having shown you the super case in detail, all I have to do is quickly flash this one, and side by side, there's no doubt. The GMT feels like an industrial product, and while the Daytona is as well, it doesn't quite look the part. And finally, I'll mention that this watch is really losing no momentum in the market. The new Batman GMT with Jubilee bracelet and the Kronergy escapement, that is already drawing down the price of the Pepsis on the market, and it's only been two days, whereas this Daytona is pretty much as strong as ever, still selling for 12400 new pre-owned for about twenty one to 22000 So in that sense, this is a little bit more secure, a place to put your money if you want to buy pre-owned. Now let's jump over to the GMT. This was the watch of 2018, maybe for the entire industry, certainly for Rolex. What does it offer? Well, a date and a dual time. Two features you won't get on the Daytona, and two features that are individually more practical than a chronograph. Together, this one wins in secretariat fashion by whole lengths. I'll also mention that the watch has a multi-use bezel. Yes, you can use it to temporarily calculate a third time zone, which is cool, but for example, if I just want to time 15 minutes, look, there it is right there. I line up the index and I just wait for the minute hand to reach the six. If I want to time 30 minutes, I wait for it to reach the 12. It's not life-saving gear, don't use it for diving, but it is quite practical and intuitive in that role. I'll also mention that the bracelet is more comfortable. It has these small individual links so it feels silken on the wrist and because the many gaps between the links you can see that to good effect underneath it vents the wrist better you're really never going to explore the absolute structural limits of these bracelets i don't think you'll ever break either of them so you may as well wear the one that's more comfortable better loom this watch again secretariat the end over. This watch features more loom, and it's simply more legible day or night. Take a look at it by day. Now take a look at the Daytona. The black centers on the hour and minute hand make them almost difficult to see at a quick glance, whereas the GMT, you recognize immediately what time it is. Turn the lights off, and its advantage grows. I'll also mention, and this is worth Emphasizing for the time being, it's not something that's forever, but it is for now. There are fewer of these on the market having been announced a year ago than there are of these having been launched three years ago. So in terms of exclusivity, this watch may be commanding more on secondary markets, but there are objectively fewer of these. Finally, more affordable new or used. The Daytona new, $12,400. The GMT new, $9,250. The Daytona pre-owned, $21,000 to $22,000. The GMT, $16,000 to $17,000. And it's likely that price is going to fall a little bit as the new Batman Jubilee GMT gets out into the market. So which of these two do I go for? Well, I'm a sucker for a watch with blue, and I do love the flashes of red. But then again, I'm not an aviator. I'm a driver. Give me the wheels when I can't have wings. I'm all about motorsports. I've watched the 24-hour at Daytona straight through and then watched more motorsports the next day without going to sleep. I am all about the imagery, the mythos, the legend, and the reality of this watch in endurance racing. I'll never win that race, but I could wear this watch. I also like the fact that the dial is considerably cleaner. The balance, the aesthetics, all of it superior to the GMT. The GMT is more functional. It does trade that sort of balance and pulchritude for functionality, but 
For sheer beauty, this watch is unrivaled amongst our pair. And I would say the case being pre-super case, having more in common with a date just or a day date, to me, that's just more attractive. I'm a watch guy who tends to prefer dress watches, and this is the timepiece that better serves in that role. In spite of the Jubilee bracelet, this is simply a more graceful and elegant watch dial and watch case. And at the end of the day, I like the substance of the bracelet. It's something that reassures me. I like the integration of the Oyster on the Daytona. The two look natural together. And overall, I'm just a guy who loves motorsports. And if you're into movements, this is cool. But a chronograph is the V12 of this test. So give me my Daytona. Cosmograph from me. Perhaps a GMT for you? Let me know in the box which of these you guys prefer personally. Loom shot to follow. GMT, Daytona. You can see the Aviator's watch takes this one easily. But then again, there are lights at Daytona at night, so you won't need it.